How's everybody doing? Fellowshipping in the Word. It's pretty cool. Um, my name is Jeff Phipps, and uh, I'm the president and director of uh, Camp Arete. We've, uh, we're a uh, Christian, based, uh, Christian youth camp based in uh, the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, and uh, we serve young adults. We serve them the Word once, once a year for a week. Um, and we bring in kids from all over the country. We get uh, kids from Texas, Florida, Virginia, Connecticut, Colorado, from Tennessee, hopefully Maryland, Fredericksburg, where's Jeremy? Sugarland. Um, we have two programs uh, that we serve kids with, uh, one for campers uh, ages 13 to 18, and then we have a servant leader program uh, for uh, kids or young adults that are ages 18 to 20. We run those uh, coterminous. We were founded with the goal of shepherding the next generation into adulthood and doing it in a way that keeps, keeps that generation connected with their faith. As many of you know that, uh, you ladies don't need to answer this question, but uh, you men, is anyone in here who's under 40? Raise your hand. Oh, two. My goodness. Where is that next generation? Where are they going? Now, Camp Aretti doesn't have all the solutions, um, but it is our goal. Um, it's our mission to keep that younger generation connected with their faith as they transition into adulthood, into school, the military, into jobs, a lot of times into their first relationships, uh, romantic relationships. Uh, we do this by teaching the Bible. We teach the Bible three times a day. We have a, a dispensational presupposition, um, a historical, grammatical, and literal uh, approach to teaching. We're always looking for what is the meaning of the passage as the author intended it, and we share that with our uh, campers. We've had uh, guest speakers, uh, Charlie Clough, uh, Andy Woods, he's probably hiding because he thought I was gonna mention him, but uh, Pastor Andy Woods, uh, Pastor Dean, Robbie Dean, Mark Musser, uh, Brett Nasworth, and the list goes on. So we feed our kids uh, the Bible three times a day. And that's really where our strength is. That's what our uniqueness is. is I think about all the things that uh, make camp a unique and interesting place. You know, we have uh, great campers. We have great staff. We have wonderful counselors. But I think the, uh, the thing that sets us apart is that our very firm belief in the power of God's word. We believe God's word is transformative. Any victories that are going to be won in the minds of these young men and women will be as a result of them being in His Word every day, renewing their minds. Amen? I heard an amen. <laughs> and it's God's Word. It's our focus. It's our mission. It's really our DNA. If there's anything you remember about tonight's talk, when you hear the word camparete, think about God's Word. The, um, I've always thought that our campers were our best uh, PR tool, so to speak. Um, so with that in mind, I have two campers here uh, tonight. Uh, Savannah, please come on up, and Victoria. Uh, they've been with us uh, both for four or five years. Uh, Victoria, this year in camp, will be uh, transitioning to uh, counselor. Let's give her a round of applause. Um, but I wanted them to share their personal testimony with you. I thought it would be a lot better for you guys to hear from campers about what we're doing. Hopefully it connects with what I just told you. Before we get to that, uh, Pastor Roseland, can you stand up, please? And Pastor King, please, if you guys would turn around. These two gentlemen here. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, full circle. Thank you. Thank you. No, Rick, can you face to the north? No. Uh, any questions, myself, Pastor Roseland, or Pastor King, you can ask them. Uh, any of us during the conference, we also have a table 
in the very back room in the very far corner that you can walk past and not see but we have one back there camp dates this year july 15th through the 21st that's july 15th through the 21st our website www.camparete.com with that said i'd like to turn it over to these young ladies Hi everyone, I'm Savannah. I'm 15 years old and this will be my fourth year at Camp Arete. Yes, and I'm Victoria Spaniel. I'm 18 years old and this will also be my fourth year at Camp Arete. So to start us off, um, camp is now based in Benton, Tennessee, and it's for ages 13 years to 18 years of age and then 18 to 20 for the Servant Leader Program. Yes, and I know I speak for both of us when I say that camp has had a huge impact in my life, so we just wanted to share with you a few ways that camp really has impacted us. Yes, yeah, so um, for me, one of the most valuable things that I take from camp are the lessons, like Pastor, like Mr. Phipps has mentioned. Every year we have many missionaries and pastors that travel from around the country to come and teach us three sessions a day. And everything that they bring to camp is stuff that is really applicable for in teenage lives. You know, you know that they have prayed about what they're going to teach. And so everything that they bring is just stuff that you can apply right now. And that's always been very helpful to me. So I always enjoy the lessons. Yes, and to go off of that, um, with the applicability of the lessons we learn, every year they try to put a theme together, so all the uh, pastors and the teachers that come, they all coordinate their lessons. Of Our first year in 2015, we had the theme of faith. It was a really broad theme, but those are still lessons four years down the road that we're going back to and that we have still stuck in our mind that we refer to these lessons and phrases that we hear in the Bible verses that we take from this camp. And another... Um, Another thing that we had in 2016, it was victory in Christ and the ultimate sacrifice and what that meant to us and how to take that and put it in our lives. And last year it was humility and the mental attitude of that and applying the humility for that. And uh, the other part of the spiritual impacts of camp and what it brings is the counselor groups and the counselors that we have. And so um, it's great to have a big group of girls all together and for us to all be together, but it's also nice to narrow it down into smaller groups. We have personal counselors in front of us where we look up to them, we look up to the point where they are now and just whether it's after every lesson that they take us aside and they might just give us a broad overview of what we just learned, or maybe they take a piece and really want to emphasize a piece that we just went over. And after these lessons, we definitely have many questions, so they're always there to answer our questions for us. And like she said, it is nice to have a big group of girls sometimes, but sometimes what you need is really... Um, <clears throat> You know, a small group of three or four girls with a counselor that you can really tell anything, you know, that will honestly wants to help you and loves you and will not judge you no matter what you say. So I love all of the counselors. <laughs> and we could go on forever about all the spiritual impacts from these camps and get really specific. But we also wanted to touch the social impacts that this camp has with us. And one of the main points was the fellowship that we have with other like-minded teens at this camp and where we get to build these lifelong relationships with these teens and what that means to us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us come from really small churches where, you know, you may have one, two, three teenagers. So to be able to come together with a lot of other like-minded teenagers for a week is really a unique experience that we don't get to do often. You know, it's really encouraging to know I'm not the only one. And while the teaching sessions are awesome, they're amazing, I love them, you know, obviously hey, we need breaks because sometimes they're a little, woo. <laughs> So um, it's a summer camp. We do activities. So some of the favorite, my favorite activities personally have been outdoor relay races, which can get crazy, but they're fun. <laughs> uh, we go swimming and we do a lot of other fun stuff like that. And it's a really neat way to be able to spend time with your friends and have fun. <laughs> And to bring all this social interaction together, of course, the adults in board members have to take away our phones and our earbuds and our laptops and any music device we have and it all literally goes into one bucket and they probably think about it every once in a while just tossing it into the lake too but it doesn't ever go that far 
but uh, they take it all up and it's all for the care that they have for us and the deep love that they want us to really focus, put all the distraction of the world aside and those distractions that can be in the palm of our hands, put it aside for a week, really focus on these lessons they're giving us and the relationship with the people around us. And so um, the other impact we wanted to focus on was the after camp impacts that we have and what we take from camp. And one of it, and was a really big one in my life, and I think Savannah's too, where they um, really drove home the importance of being in the scriptures daily and taking it seriously and the consistency of it. And so. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> and one of the ways that they help us stay in the Word every day is every year after camp, there are two groups, a girls group and a boys group, and each year we read through the Bible cover to cover. Sometimes we do it chronologically, <clears throat> Sometimes we do it cover to cover. Sometimes we read a little from the Old, a little from the New Testament each day. But no matter what, we always get through the whole Bible. And it's a really neat experience, too, because every week, um, Miss Joyce is the head of the girls. And so every week, she sends out a lovely email. <laughs> <laughs> she sends out a lovely email that summarizes what we've read the week before because that's always helpful since sometimes if you're in Isaiah or something and it's really confusing, it's nice to have somebody say, okay, here's what you read and here's why um, you don't need to be confused about this. So that's always really neat. And also, um, things have grown out of the friendships at camp as well. Like we have a camp group chat text texting thing. And so... Um, and that was that was started by campers. We're just all buddies in the group. And so if you're ever feeling down or you need, uh, if you have a prayer request or something, you know, you just text the group chat. And there's always people on that are ready to encourage you and send you Bible verses. So it's just a really neat thing to be a part of. You know, camp doesn't stop after the seven days. So it's neat. Yes, and all this with the connections or the group chat and with the retreats that we have throughout the year just to get together it all just helps us lock shields together that much further and to encourage each other throughout the life and so to wrap this all up uh, some of the ways camp has impacted our lives we just gave a few but whether it's by the relationships created or the bible lessons we learn those vital and critical bible lessons in our lives and um uh, being able to take afterwards that we need to start taking this Christian walk seriously now in our teen years and to start being in a consistent basis of everyday learning and growing in his word. And so we have yet to hear from any of the campers, uh, yet to not have the reaction from any of the campers that this is our favorite week of the whole year. And we look forward to this and it, <laughs> And it just encourages us and gives that, that push that we need to go and run as hard as we can for the next year ahead of us leading up. So if there's any teenagers in your life, whether they be your kids or grandkids or neighbors, if you have any teens that um, are interested in getting plugged into a Christian youth group that will point them in the right direction, Camp Rete would be a great thing for them because I know it has been a great thing for both of us. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> July 15th to the 21st. www.camparete.com. Good job. Well, thank you, Victoria and Savannah. Isn't that encouraging to know that there's hope out there for the younger generation? Thank you. God gave him the name that is above every name. Jesus Christ is Lord, says Philippians 2. With that in mind, please turn in your hymnals to number... Let's see here. I have a different version than you. Uh, number 96 and 97. Same words, two different melodies. All hail the power of Jesus' name. So we're going to sing both of these versions this evening. I'm going to blend them together. You know, one thing that always bugged me about music in churches is that, first of all, if they're run by musical directors, they 
save the good stuff for the choir and the special group and the ensembles and they give the scraps to the congregation. Well, we're not going to do that here tonight. We're going to give you the good stuff. And what I mean by that is I'd like to come up with arrangements that are musically interesting while keeping the hymns biblically accurate. That's the criteria we use. And so we're going to start with number 90. Let's see. Once again, what's the... Number 96, we'll start with that one. We'll sing two verses of 96, and then we'll have a little segue over to 97. All Hail the Power was written by Edward Peronet in 1780, and the melodies we have today are not the original melody. There was a third melody that was written for this hymn. It's called Miles Lane. They didn't put somebody's, uh, they didn't put the author, the composer's name on it like they do now. They usually came up with some term, maybe a geographical location, Miles Lane. Maybe that was the name of the church where the composer uh, resided or or played an organ. Or maybe it was named after some inspiration they had, but rarely do you see it named after the person. So if you look off to the right at the bottom there, you'll see the title given for the melody. So where it says Diadem and Coronation, that's the title of the melody. Edward Perronette wrote this, I said, in 1780. And then the second melody that was written for it was written by Oliver Holden. And then uh, he was a music educator in New England. Edward Perronette was an Anglican minister who got fed up in the late 1700s with Anglican nonsense. Didn't like the formalism. He broke with the Anglican church and joined the Wesleys. That lasted for a while, but they had a disagreement over who should administer communion. He broke off from them and started a local church, and that's where he ministered. Well, along comes uh, James Eller in 1838, the hat maker in England, writes a third melody, which is one we're gonna sing first. He migrated to America three years later. God uses of people in a variety of ways to accomplish his will. This is a great hymn of the faith. We'll sing all four verses. First two verses, 97. 90, first two verses, 96. Second two verses, 97. Please stand.
you have your Bibles, would you please turn to Exodus chapter 35. We come to the point in our worship service this evening where we have the opportunity to worship through giving. This is, of course, not new. It's something that God instru- instrumental with Israel, with the tabernacle, and he let the need be known what was needed to build the tabernacle where God would dwell with Israel. And after a little hiccup with a golden calf and some other, other things, uh, Israel was motivated to give. And in Exodus 35, verse 20, it says, Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel departed from Moses' presence after the need had been made known. Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the holy garments. Then all whose hearts moved them, both men and women, came and brought, and it goes through a whole list of things. But let's skip to verse 24. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver and bronze brought the Lord's contribution, and every man who had in his possession acacia wood for all the work of the service, they brought it. They were moved to do so by being made known to them what the need was. It's always amazing to me with this conference how it's always offered by grace. There's no charge of coming, but of course grace does cost. Just as our salvation is through grace by faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ paid the penalty. He paid the full price. There's nothing for us to add to or to take away. But it cost the Father everything. So we just want to let the need be known that this conference does cost. And there is an added expense this year with extra security that we just want you to be aware of. And make, if you have a, write a check, make it out to West Houston Bible Church. Don't try to worry about anything else. I'll tell you what happens if there's anything extra here in just a moment. But if uh, whatever you move in your heart to give remember god loves a cheerful giver but let's note something that happened i think probably only one time in history look at exodus 36 verse 5 they came to moses and said the people are bringing much more than enough for the construction work which the lord commanded us to perform So Moses issued a command and a proclamation was circulated throughout the camp saying, Let no man or woman any longer perform work for the contribution of the sanctuary. First time a building program refused extra money in all of human history. (laughs) Thus the people were restrained from bringing any more, for the material they had was sufficient. And that's the wonderful thing about God's grace. It is always sufficient. And more than enough for all the work to perform it. The conference usually goes a little bit over breaking even with your free will contributions, but if there is extra, it will be divided among Dean Bible Ministries, Schaefer Seminary, and West Houston Bible Church. So this is our opportunity to give and worship the Lord through the service of giving. Uh, So let's pause for a moment for prayer, and then we'll do so. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the salvation that we have in Christ, and it's through faith in Him that we can come before Your throne of grace, make our requests known. We thank You for all of the provision and the blessings that You've given to each one of us, Father, and this opportunity to be here together this this week and this evening, and the opportunity to be equipped for service through the teaching of Your Word. And we pray for Sharam tonight, that He will speak the words that we need to hear as the body of Christ the body of Christ needing to be equipped and well understood in how to approach uh, our culture in many different ways. But may we be equipped from your word on how to understand Islam and how to always be ready to give a defense and yet with gentleness and reverence that you always be glorified. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It's great to be back here with you tonight, and um, what a blessing it is to also worship the Lord together. Um, I wanted to say one more time, I don't know if I communicate this this afternoon, just uh, how grateful I am for the opportunity to be here and to get to just be a part of the equipping of the body of Christ. Um, so uh, again, I want to uh, I want to thank uh, Schaefer Theological Seminary, Dr. Woods, uh, um, Pastor Dean, Houston Bible Church, all of you and the volunteers here uh, for putting this on and for having us, uh, having me here to be able to share with you in this platform. So thank you guys. So God bless you and uh, praise God for you. Um, I wanted to, uh, we have a lot to cover tonight in this presentation. And as I mentioned this afternoon, we're going to build upon uh, today is focused upon uh, really understanding apologetics, and tonight is focused on the ideology of Islam, because sadly, there is much confusion and deception about what is Islam, what is the ideology and teaching of Islam at its core, and so we want to cover some of that for you tonight, and uh, be able to... Uh, Pull the, pull the veil back, so to speak, and really look at really what it is. Uh, some of the basic beliefs, but also some of the deeper things that uh, are being um, perpetrated, really, in my opinion, as propaganda. We are seeing an all-out propaganda war with uh, trying to uh, hide or cover the real face of Islam. Uh, and, and it's not like we don't have history on our side to look at 1,400 years of history with Islam. So before I do that, very quickly again, our sources. I went over it this afternoon. Uh, since we're talking about Islam, we're going to be quoting from the plural sources of Islam. We're going to be quoting from the Quran. We're going to be quoting from the Sunnah. And we're also going to be quoting from the Sharia law book. All three tonight we're going to be focusing on as we get a complete picture of Islam. One of the challenges that I have and those who come against me or maybe you know, want to attack me or who are apologists for Islam is that, look, you're taking things out of context. You know, you quote the Quran, you're taking things out of context. Well, that's why we want to quote all three sources if we can. When we quote all three sources, including the, the, uh, the Sharia law book that I mentioned, the classical manual in Islamic law, really case is closed. And now the argument that's only, the only argument that's left is an emotional argument. Well, it's not very nice. Well, I would argue Islam is not very nice. So this is an issue of, of uh, factual information. So let me first cover with some fundamental teachings of Islam that hopefully we would know, but at least we give a foundation so that I don't quote-unquote misrepresent it. Number one, Muslims believe that Allah is the one God. So there is, a, there is a concept within Islam of monotheism. As I mentioned earlier, the claim of Muhammad is Allah told him, go and destroy the paganism that was in Mecca and establish uh, the monotheistic God, worship of one God. Of course, he forgot to get rid of his idol. We talked about that earlier, of his tribe, the, the, the Hubal uh, idol that they worship. But this is the concept of Islam. So if there is one area that we can say, look, Muslims and Christians, um, have a similar concept, it is the concept of belief in one God. Now remember, what do Muslims believe about Christians? That we worship three gods, okay? So they don't share that view with us, <laughs> but, but, but this is an, uh, a, a um, sort of olive branch that many Christians are trying to put out there to Muslims. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier this afternoon, the Quran, which means the recitation is supposed to be the word of Allah. That's what Muslims believe. Muslims, of course, believe, and, and, the, and Muhammad said it, that he is the final prophet of seven, right? So we have five of the Old Testament prophets, then Jesus, number six, Muhammad is number seven. Islam is the final religion, according to Islam. What's, what's really sad, and I covered this on Wednesday, about this whole common word concept that we see within our churches and within missional practices is that true Muslims would never believe that, that there's a common word, other than to correct us, because they believe that their message is the, is the final message, that Muhammad is the final prophet, and that all other messages have been abrogated. And I'll cover that again more on Wednesday. Of course, they believe that Jesus, his title is Esau in the Quran, is simply a prophet, number six in the line of seven, that he, is, he uh, was never crucified. We'll cover that. He is still alive. He's coming back as a prophet, as a secondary figure to the Islamic Messiah. 
So if the Muslim says to you, the Christian, you know, we believe Jesus is coming again. And we go, there you go. Look, look how much common ground we have. They believe Jesus is coming. We believe Jesus is coming. It's a very different Jesus. In fact, the question that was asked earlier about eschatology and the Islamic Antichrist, one of the things, we have a DVD called The, the uh, Islam and God's Judgment in the Last Days, which is a prophetic look at, at what's, what we're seeing. Very clearly, Muslims are taught and believe that the, the Antichrist is the Jesus of the Bible. They call him al Masih ad dajjal which means, Dajjal means false, Masih means the Messiah. He is the false Messiah. And their Jesus is the real Jesus. And of course, finally, Muslims clearly believe that Allah does not have, is not a father, nor does he have a son. These, are, these, these should be like Islam 101, okay? These are just foundational beliefs. Also, Muslims believe in the five pillars of Islam. Let's quickly go through those. Number one, they believe in the first pillar, which is called shahara, the profession. This is what our young people are being taught in public schools today. They're having our kids do the shahara. There, there's some examples I'll give tomorrow about uh, what we see within some of the government-run paid schools where they're having calligraphy exercises and taking on field trips to mosques and, and, and promoting videos that actually have the shahada. By the way, in the textbooks, they have this, the five pillars, with the first pillar is the shahada. Imagine if they have the sinner's prayer in our public schools, right? Right? People would, their, their minds would explode. The ACLU would have a lawsuit before the end of the day. Not so for Islam. Second uh, pillar is the Salat, their daily prayers. Of course, they are commanded to pray at least, at least five times a day, right? And in their prayers, do, they do a cyclical prayer. It's ritualistic. They're called rakas. And here's the part that, again, most people don't understand. Every Muslim, whether you speak Arabic or not, must pray in Arabic. This was a problem I had as a Muslim because I'm from Iran. I don't speak Arabic. I'm Persian. Remember that? <laughs> Meow. So, <laughs> so I speak Farsi. And so growing up, I thought, what kind of a God doesn't speak my language? <laughs> the majority of the world's Muslim population don't speak Arabic. Over 80% of the world's Muslim population don't speak Arabic. Yet every single one must pray in Arabic because they're taught that Arabic is the perfect language. Remember I said earlier this afternoon, the Bible has three languages, Hebrew, some Aramaic, and Greek. The Quran is only supposed to have one language, Arabic. It's supposed to be the language of heaven. Except most people don't speak it. Kind of weird, isn't it? Number three, the zakat, the almsgiving. And there's a breakdown within the Sharia law manual of the eight parts that the alms are given to. When Muslims give to zakat, they give to eight parts. One of those parts, by the way, is for jihad, and we'll cover that. But one of the misconceptions that Muslim Islamist groups in America are, are, are bringing about is the fact that, well, part of zakat goes to help the poor, the needy. Yes, the poor and needy Muslims. Zakat technically is not supposed to, if they're in the upper house, which I'll talk about a little bit later, they're not supposed to be giving to non-Muslims. Number four, fasting. And fasting, of course, is manifested during the month of Ramadan, right? The month of Ramadan, which is, remember, we said earlier, the month which the revelation of the Quran was given. This month, Muslims fast from sun up to sundown. They don't eat. Oftentimes, they try to have a, a, a meal before sun up, and they gorge, usually after sundown. And they repeat this for 30 days. And Ramadan, of course, cycles because it's based on a lunar calendar. And finally, the Hajj. What's the Hajj? Remember the pilgrimage to Mecca? Remember we talked about that earlier? They have to go to Mecca? And so this is a once-in-a-lifetime uh, obligation if they are able. If there, there are some conditions, again, that's spilled out in the Sharia law book that certain reasons if they cannot go um, but if they are able to go, it is a once-in-a-lifetime uh, obligation. Now, there is a sixth unofficial pillar of Islam, which is jihad, and I'll define it for you later. Then tomorrow, we're going to get into more aspects of the obligations of jihad because there is much misconception in America at, from our government, from our education system, from our media, from Islamic apologists, and in the church about what is jihad. Many Muslim apologists, I just read an article from Muslim apologists, uh, a lot of these uh, newspapers will, will, will have editorials from Muslims to refute people like me, and they'll come and say jihad simply means struggle. 
struggle. That's a lie. It's not just any struggle. I'll give you the definition later. Now, the most important belief, and I'm going to repeat this one more time, that for a fundamentalist Muslim, a devout Muslim, the most important belief is this. Islam is the final religion. Every other religion has been abrogated, nullified, including Christianity and Judaism. So hopefully you're seeing a problem with how are we going to quote-unquote coexist and live in peace when they believe that they have the final religion. Now, I want to cover here the biggest elephant in the room with Islam. Let me ask you this question, and you see how much of an issue it is. Here you go. You ready? How many of you, now listen to the question, please, carefully. How many of you have never heard that Islam is a religion of peace? Okay, can you look around the room for a second? Now, one hand went up. That's how good you and I have been lied to. That's how well the propaganda. Now, where have you heard that from? Give me some quick examples. Okay, so elected officials, CNN. the media, Teachers. okay, yeah, Muslims themselves, of course, apologists for Islam, the interfaith groups, college professors, our school system, right? Did I miss anybody? Churches, yeah, pastors is coming from the interfaith uh, ecumenical uh, emergent church pastors. Maybe some conservative pastors that will teach that Muslims are inherently peaceful. Islam is inherently peaceful. Uh, Intellectual, sure. The, again, those who are um, writers, scholars, who will claim that Islam is peaceful. So let's address this issue. Before I address this issue, uh, this mantra, as I said, is being defended at all costs. And um, this, is, oh, this was a slip. I shouldn't have put that in there. Obama is Islam's greatest apologist. Was I, I wasn't supposed to put that in there. No, I was. I'm sorry. So, there, is, there has been no greater defender. When I say greater, I mean we most well-known. Not that he's the best defender, but there was no greater defender of Islam than Barack Hussein Obama worldwide. Because you will never find a videotape, an audio tape, a recording of him saying one derogatory thing about Islam. Yet he claimed he was a Christian, and how many times did he bash Christianity? Yet you will never hear him once denounce Islam, say anything negative about Islam. In fact, every time something happened, he apologized. In fact, here's a statement that he made back in 2016 at a mosque after the San Bernardino attacks that happened in California where two people who were here on one on a uh, um, fiancé visa, right? They went and killed 14 people in San Bernardino. He was speaking at a mosque in Baltimore and said this, this, this statement. So let's start with this fact, according to Barack Hussein Obama. It's a fact. For more than 1,000 years, people have been um, drawn to Islam's message of peace. For 1,000 years, really? Because that's what world history shows us, right? It doesn't show us Islamic conquest for 1,000 years. According to, according to a colleague of mine, Dr. Bill Warner, who has mapped out Islamic warfare for the last thousand years, plus he claims that the death toll of Islamic conquest and jihad is 270 million. But, you know, let's listen to Barack Hussein Obama. Let's not. And the very word, now listen to this, and the very word itself, Islam, comes from salam, which means peace. There you go. He said it. It's done. The standard greeting, which is assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, right? Now, that is the greeting, but let's look at the word itself. Is the word Islam mean peace? The word Islam is not from salam. It is aslama or salama, and it doesn't mean peace. The word means surrender. The Arabic definition of that word means surrender. One who is surrendered. To who? To Islam and Allah, the God of Islam. So well, where does the concept of peace come from? Ah, once you've all surrendered, there's peace. <laughs> Who's ready to sign up? Nobody better put their hand up. So the challenge is for us non-Muslims, or for me as an apostate, remember I'm worse than you, you are a kufra, you're an infidel, an unbeliever. I'm an apostate. The challenge is, 
that if we desire to not have surrender to Islam, then by definition, we are not at peace with Islam. Now notice I didn't say an individual Muslim. So I'm not talking about you have a neighbor who's a Muslim who is a really nice person. They, I hear this, of course, all the time. But Sharam, what you're saying can't be true because my, my neighbor, they're so nice. Okay, they may be really nice. They may be not. I don't know. I, don't, I wouldn't know until I talk to them and find out are they telling the truth or are they not. Quick story. I, there was a, Last year I was speaking in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. A Muslim man came in, uh, not the one who threatened our conference, a different one who came in the door, claimed he was a very peaceful Muslim. So we sat down and before the, con the thing, we had a few questions. So I said, look, you claim to be a peaceful Muslim. You believe in freedom of religion, freedom of speech. You love America for what it stands. I said, but if I was in a Muslim country, I wouldn't have that freedom, right? So he kind of paused. Well, yeah, 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 but those are not, those are not, that's not representing Islam. I go, really? Because remember, I saw it firsthand in Iran. So I said, let me ask you a question. Uh, you claim to be peaceful. So, you know, I, I'm an apostate, so I deserve to be killed according to the teachings of your prophet, right? He again paused. I said, was that a hard question? According to the teachings of Islam, I left Islam, I deserve to be killed. Isn't that what your prophet said? Remember, he's claiming to be a peaceful Muslim. So he kind of pauses and he says, well, you know, I can't answer that. And I said, exactly. That's why I asked the question. Because I asked the question to find out if you're lying. And now I know you're lying to me. Because if you're a peaceful Muslim, shouldn't you denounce the fact that any person that leaves a religion in a free country like America doesn't deserve a death sentence? But you see, what I was asking him to do was to go against the teachings of his prophet. Remember what I told you earlier this afternoon? They can't question anything that Muhammad says. So we'll talk about this notion again as we go, but there is no peace with Islam. In fact, you're going to see how they view our house. The concept then, you go, where does this concept come from of Islam being peaceful? Well, because there was a dualism in Islam. Okay, Muhammad, he gets the revelation in 601, remember the cave, right, with the visitation, and then he goes and says, look, you know what, he's given these verses, and there's some early verses of Islam in Mecca, they're called the Meccan verses. 13, approximately 12 to 13 years, he's in Mecca, and by the best estimate, I mean, if I want to be generous to him, he got 150 followers. But then something happens, he decides, there's a call for hijra, migration, we're going to immigrate. I'll talk about that tomorrow. We're going to immigrate to Medina. At that time, it was a Jewish community called Yathrib. There were Jewish tribes there. He forced some out because they wouldn't convert. Some actually thought that he was the Messiah. Because remember, what was he claiming? I'm the final prophet. God has sent me as the final prophet. And there's one tribe that wouldn't flee, wouldn't convert. We'll talk about what happened to them Later, And then Yathrib's name was changed later to Medina, the city of the prophet. And then Muhammad claimed new revelation came from Allah, new verses. This is what we call abrogation. So let's look at Surah 126 in the Quran. Surah chapter 2, 106. Remember, this is according to the God of Islam. We, plural, I thought they only believe in one God. We do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten except that we bring forth one better than it or similar to it. You go, uh, hold on, time out. What? <laughs> so God is going to give you revelation, and then at some point God decides, you know what? I'm going to give them something better. Uh, was your revelation that you give good or not good? Do we see anywhere in the Bible where God says, this is good. Well, well hold on, hold on, but it's not the best. Let me give you something better. No, because God already gave us his best, the true God. Amen? In fact, he gave us the best, his son. Amen? But according to Allah, well, remember, according to Muhammad, because there is no other witness, Allah says there are verses that have been abrogated. And if you refute it, then you don't know what you're talking about. Now, this leads to a concept with Islam that is very critical for you to understand. Again, tonight's presentation I have on DVD. I only have an hour to share. The DVD is like two plus hours. The concept is the concept called two houses. This is what we don't understand about Islam because there is a dualism or an abrogation. The early house of Islam, which is where uh, Muhammad was in Mecca, they, 
was coined Dar al Harb, the house of war. What a nice term. What a nice term that Islam has for a non Muslim country. So, Muhammad was in a place of war, not peace, because he was in Mecca in, a, in the minority, right? Had he tried to uprise against those in Mecca, he would have been very easily squashed. But when he hijrahed to Medina with all his followers, then the, then the verses change, his behavior changed, he becomes more like a warlord, and now we have the concept of Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam. You go, well, Sharam, what are the differences? Well, the major difference is in the treatment of the unbelievers. Let me say that one more time. The major difference is in the treatment of those who are unbelievers. Because in one, Mecca, Muhammad left the unbelievers alone. Why? Because, again, there was nothing he could do to them, right? He only has 150 followers after 13 years. Once he amasses wealth and a military begins to commit political raids against people, commit assassinations, and, and, and gain money, now, now, according to him, in the Dar al-Islam, the verses change. This is the concept of abrogation. And there are those apologists for Islam will, that will lie to Americans and say Islam is peaceful. And they'll quote this verse. By the way, the claim is... Of course, we know by those who say that such a thing is look, Sharam, Islam is pluralistic. We believe Islam believes in pluralism. That can't be the case, right? Because Islam believes it is the final religion. How can it be the final religion? All other religions have been abrogated and yet believe in pluralism. Let me ask you this question As Christians, should we believe in plur pluralism? Only eight of you answered. Let me ask it one more time. As Christians, do you, should we believe in pluralism? No. no. Now you go, well, Sharon, we live in a society and under a constitution that accepts pluralism. I could give you a good argument. That was never the intent of the founders. Meaning America was not founded on multi-religions. It was founded on a Judeo-Christian foundation. And it was the issue, the separation issue was an issue of member denomination, not whether uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, and, and Islam are equal to the Judeo-Christian foundation or that we should abandon our Judeo-Christian foundation as we have for pluralism. But the claim of Islam is that it's pluralistic. Well, as Christians, we would clearly say we don't believe in pluralism because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. There is no other way, i.e., we believe in an exclusionist ideology. Do we not? Okay? Not a lot of Christians today want to stand on that uh, rock. Well, we, I mean, we don't want to be seen as, you know, a clique, a club. It's not a club. It's called the church. And it's not a clique, it's called the family of God. And you and I were adopted by our Heavenly Father into that family, blood-bought and paid for. Therefore, I think we should give some respect to him and stand with him. Amen. Rather than being afraid to, to say, uh, I don't want to be uh, deemed as a Christian today. But Islam claims pluralism. Where do they get this concept? Surah 256. This is the verse ad nauseum, I mean literally ad nauseum, that is quoted at, 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 from apologists. Let there be no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Whoever rejects evil and believes in Allah hath grasped the most trustworthy handhold that never breaks. So they'll quote this verse and say, bingo, bongo, there is no compulsion, Sharam. Yes, that's true. Surah 256 is an unabrogated verse. Does that make sense now? Are you starting to see the dualism? If we don't understand this dualism, we will never understand Islam. Because Islam looks different in the West than it does in Iran or Pakistan or Saudi. So we go, see, that's radical. This is the real Islam. Did you hear that? That's radical. Oh, that's a radical form of Islam. The Muslims here, they're the real, the, the, the true Muslims. Wrong. The Saudis are the true Muslims. In fact, I'll make the case, ISIS are the truest Muslims. Because they're actually following the exact uh, actions, behavior of their prophet. The prophet of Islam was not a peaceful man. He was a homicidal, genocidal, pedophilic maniac. He was a false prophet, 
And as I mentioned earlier, he should have stuck to his guns. He was demon-possessed. And maybe he should have just taken that leap off the cliff. <laughs> maybe we wouldn't be here today. So, but here's the problem. This verse is only permissible in the lower house. So when Muslims live in a non-Muslim country, they are allowed to be able to say to non-Muslims, we're not going to force you at all. We can coexist. You hear that, don't you? That's the mantra coming from our churches. We're going to have peace. Rick Warren's peace initiative. P-E-A-C-E. -E. We're going to build schools and hospitals and live side by side, Muslims and Christians, and it'll be kumbaya. <laughs> Sounds great, Rick. Maybe you should study Islam and know what happens when they get the upper hand. Maybe you should talk to some Christians who have been massacred, their families have been massacred, their houses burned, their children crucified before their eyes, who have lived under when Islam gets the upper hand. Maybe you should talk to some women who've come out of Islam, who've lived in Iran under Sharia and been raped and sold as child slaves. So, that's the lower house. Here's the next argument. Again, I'm going to get to the upper house. Here's the next argument. We've got to move on. Sharam, Islam is peaceful because it forbids violence. Here's the verse to back it up. In fact, George Bush quoted this verse. Obama quoted this verse. Our presidents have quoted this verse. Somebody should have told them they're misquoting it. Surah 532, that whosoever killeth a human being for other than manslaughter or corruption in the earth, it shall be if he is as if he had killed all mankind. There you go. See? The verse says, if you kill anybody other than for manslaughter, meaning defend of your life, or for corruption, meaning that it is a breaking the, the criminal law of, of Allah, then therefore, it's like you've killed all people. Wow. Here's the problem. It's only part of the verse. How about we look at the whole verse? Surah 532. Here's the first half of the verse. For that cause... We decreed, again, this is Allah speaking, we, we decreed for the children of Israel. Oh, wait a second. This only applies to the Jews. Ah, that whosoever killed a human being for other than manslaughter or corruption in the earth, it shall be as if he had killed all mankind. Well, that kind of changes the context. Yeah. <laughs> so you Jews, if you kill anybody other than these conditions, it is as if you've killed all mankind. Therefore, we have a right, Muslims, to be able to kill the Jews. Because look at, look at how they behave. Which is why, sadly, there are verses in the Quran that call the Jews apes and pigs and monkeys. Islam is and has been the single greatest anti-Semitic ideology in the history of the world. 1,400 years and running. Then it goes on to say the next verse. See, context matters, right? As good Bible scholars, as pastors, as teachers, we're supposed to teach context. Read the whole verse, read surrounding verses, read the chapter so we understand context. The only reward of those who make war upon Allah and his messenger and strive after corruption in the land will be that they will be killed or crucified. But it's peaceful. Who was it talking about? Children of Israel. First and foremost, the Jews. That's context. If the Jews do this and they persist, they should be killed or crucified. Now, by extension, it applies to the Christians. Because remember, we're the people of the book, according to the Quran. Or they can have their hands and feet on altar sites cut off or will be expelled out of the land. One of the three. Now, in the upper house, when they go to the unabrogated verses, now we see... Over 100 verses, abrogated verses, in the Medinan verses of the Quran, according to Muhammad, remember he got revelation later, specifically calling for this type of violence towards Christians and Jews. In this upper house, Dar al Islam, now we have verses kicking in, and the verse of verses is Surah chapter 9. Surah chapter 9 is the last chapter, according to Muhammad, that was given to him in Medina. And it is the chapter that is called the chapter of repentance. That's the term, that's the, the title for that chapter. Repentance of who? The unbelievers, the kufar. The word there again, kufra, means filth. 
The word infidel is nowhere in the Quran, by the way. That's a nice way of saying unbeliever or the actual Arabic word kufra, K-U-F-R, or kufar, K-U-F-A-R. Kufar is a plural term for kufra, means filth. That's the exact translation. Dar al-Islam, Surah 9, t- verse 5 and 29 to 33, gives you the three options for those unbelievers now. Remember, let there be no compulsion in religion. What happened to that? What happened to that verse? It got abrogated. That means when they go to the upper house, the latter verses supersede and nullify the earlier verses. Now, some Islamic apologists would say, but Surah 9 was only for back then. Muhammad was only talking about Mecca. That can't be the case. Here's why. If it's talking about repentance of unbelievers, was there only unbelievers in Mecca? No. There is unbelievers around the world, right? And if Islam is to be the final religion, then the verse applies to unbelievers wherever they are found and for as long as they are in existence which tomorrow we'll see will end when Jesus comes back. <laughs> Three options. Convert, dimitude, fight to the death. Here's the verse, Surah 9.5. But when the forbidden months are past, fight and slay the pagans. The word in the, in the Arabic would be the kufar. Wherever you find them, seize them, beleaguer them, lie in wait for them. By the way, any, any issue about slay? Anybody confused about the word slay? I had a Muslim apologist once try to tell me that is a spiritual slay. I said, what on earth is a spiritual slay? And I'll prove to you very clearly that we know it's a literal slay because remember who's the perfect example of Islam? Muhammad. Now, you've, you got fight. Fight and kill. Why were they fighting and killing? Because that's the commandment. So what's the first option? If, you, if the unbeliever doesn't want to die. Let's read it. Beleaguer them, lie in wait for them in every stratagem of war. But if they repent and establish regular prayers and practice regular charity, meaning if they establish the five pillars. Right? Remember, the first pillar is the shahada. That's the profession. That's the repentance. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. There was a question that came online during, during the break that someone told me about, well, why is it that does the Quran have equality to Allah, meaning that is it holy? Well, they, remember, they believe the Quran was inspired and given word for word from heaven. But here's the interesting thing. Why is the shahada have Muhammad in it? Do we say, I confess and repent in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and David? What? I confess and repent in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and Moses. Well, what? Why are they saying you have to call upon there is no God but Allah and the messenger of Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. In fact, if you go to the Dome of the Rock, how many of you been to Israel? You go to the Dome of the Rock, look at the inscription. Muhammad is in the same line as Allah. He's not down below. He's at the same line. So are they deifying Muhammad? This is a problem I had, by the way, as a Muslim. Why are we praying and can, repenting upon the name of Muhammad? Think about that for a second. So, option one, you see it clearly? Repent, right? Convert. Okay, you convert, no problem, you're at peace. How many of you are planning on converting? Nobody raise your hand. Okay, option two. Later it says in verse 29, once again, specifically, fight those who do not believe in Allah and the last day. And it goes on to say, and names them by name and fight the people of the book. Now, who is the people of the book? Very clearly, when the Quran says people of the scripture, people of the book is talking about Jews and Christians. Fight them. Okay. Who do not accept the religion of truth, which is Islam. Now, until they do what? Pay tribute. It's called the jizya tax. The, sh- the Sharia law manual has a whole section on dima, al dima, dimitude. Anybody heard of that? Dimitude. Dimitude is the subjugation of non Muslims under the rule of Islam. When they get the upper hand, they are to have dimitude. This is not radical Islam. This is 1400 years of Islamic history and the clear teaching of Muhammad because if they will not repent, secondary option for them is you pay a jizya. Now, the jizya tax is a protection tax. It literally is a protection tax, like the mafia. So you, you pay us a tax, we protect you, we won't kill you, 
We won't let anybody kill you, but you have, you're a second-class citizen, and, the, and if I have time later in, in the conference, I'll go through the whole section, and I'll read to you the conditions that are given to dimmies, what they can and cannot do. You'll see there is no freedom for those dimmies. They're second-class. Now, did you pick up the third option? Remember, convert was one. Dimitude was two. What's the third option? Well, specifically, what does the verse say? Fight. Fight the unbelievers. Meaning, now, the Muslim is commanded, if they will not convert, if they will not flee, if they will not pay the jizya, you must fight them until someone wins to the death. Again, this is not radical Islam. This is not ISIS. This is directly out of the Quran. And there's no way that Surah 9 was, ap- was, was fulfilled just in Mecca. James White, when he brought the apologist that we'll talk about on Wednesday, that's what he said. He claimed that's only for a four-month period and it was no longer applicable after Mecca. It's a blatant lie. Because, as I said, the fight must continue to repentance until there is no longer any unbeliever. There are a whole heck of a lot of unbelievers in the world who are not Muslims, right? And we know that the behavior of Muhammad and the successive caliphs of Muhammad carried this verse outside of the Arabic Peninsula. So if it was only applicable for Mecca, when Muhammad came back to Mecca and routed Mecca, then we shouldn't have ever seen them carry this verse outside, but Islamic history tells us that. And, and, and what is the purpose of, of, of how they're going to do this? What is this fighting? Remember jihad, the word struggle, the claim that it's struggle? Well, here is the definition of the word jihad. Jihad is the way that they're going to fight to establish the rule of Allah, the way of Allah, and deal with the unbelievers. So the Reliance of Travelers, section 09.0, and tomorrow I'll be, I'll be citing more of this, the classic manual of Islamic sacred law, defines the word jihad for us. Listen, you don't need Obama to tell you what jihad means, and you don't need a Muslim apologist to tell you what jihad means. The most well uh, the most well-verified uh, Islamic source book of Sharia in history tells you what jihad means. So why don't we look at what it says? Don't take my opinion for it. Jihad means to struggle. Okay, Sharam, let's go home. There you go. It's a struggle. How about we read the rest of it? Jihad means to struggle against who? Non-Muslims. And is etymologically derived from the word mujahada. Anybody heard of mujahideen? That's where the word comes from, from jihad. Or jihad comes from that word. Signifying warfare to establish the religion. Oh, well that changes kind of things a little bit, doesn't it? Now how do we know, again, this is not spiritual warfare. I mean, as Christians, let's be honest, we believe obviously in spiritual warfare, right? Right, the Bible tells us we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. So therefore we know we have, we believe in the concept of spiritual warfare. Well, to some extent, Muslims do as well. They believe in demons and angels. They believe in heaven and hell. Uh, They believe in sin. So there is a, and I'll cover that in a minute, there is an internal struggle for the Muslim against the flesh. That's true. But that's not what this verse is talking about because the Sharia law manual goes on to say, this is the lesser jihad. You go, well, Sharam, see, it's lesser. It's less significant. No, the reason it's lesser is because it's not going to remain for all time. Remember, it's going to end when their Jesus comes back. We'll cover that Wednesday. So what it's telling you is it's lesser because it's going to end. What's the greater jihad? The greater jihad is the internal struggle against the flesh. Sadly for Muslims, that continues forever. Here's a concept that most people don't understand and most Muslims don't understand. That there is no guarantee that when they go to heaven or paradise, if they make it there, that their struggle against the flesh continues. Remember, they're going there to have sex. The men are. So there's still a sensuality there. So how sad that when they go to heaven, even if they go to heaven, that they're still going to have a struggle with the flesh that they're going to have to wage. The good news that we should be telling them, instead of telling them all this common word garbage, is to say, look, the good news is that if you have your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you call upon him to be saved, you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart. The good news is that God will take away this sinful flesh, this sinful body, this broken body. We get new bodies in heaven. We will no longer struggle with the flesh. Amen? Amen. That's the good news. That's what we should be telling them. So that's the greater jihad. The lesser jihad doesn't mean it's less important. It just means it's going to end. 
How do we know it's real warfare, though? Some of you are thinking, well, Shram, how do we know it's actual warfare? How do we know they're waging war? Well, what is the, what is the measure of jihad? What is the ultimate measure of jihad for Muslims? The ultimate measure of jihad is they're willing to lay their life down. Well, how can it be spiritual if they're willing to die? Ah. Too much logic? Did I lose you? <laughs> how can it be spiritual if they're willing to die? Got to be a literal fight <laughs> if you're willing to literally die. You know, we battle spiritual warfare, right? But Satan can't kill me. Did I, did I lose? Is that, was that right theology, Dr. Woods? Is that okay or no? Did I, did I, am I? <laughs> Satan can't kill me unless the Lord allows that. He can't take my life unless the Lord allows it. Maybe I should have prefaced that last part. Look at Job, exactly, perfect. Look at Job. So we fight a spiritual battle. Now, in that spiritual battle, there are times when we're praying where we sense that warfare, don't we? But in order for the Muslim to be willing to lay his life down in an act of jihad, that struggle against the non-Muslims, it has to be literal, which is why Islam teaches that the highest aspiration for salvation and jihad is to become a martyr. What's called a shaheed. Okay, a shaheed. The shaheed is a term for a martyr. And we get really sucked up in our culture because it just sounds interesting, I guess. I think it's actually sick that we get so caught up with the whole 72 virgins thing. Let's look at what the verse says. Musnad Ahmad in uh, Ibn Hanbal. Hadith, this is a hadith by Hanbal. Now, it is not a sahih hadith, it is a Hassan hadith, meaning it's a good hadith. It's not the most authenticated, but it's one that Muslims hang their hat on on this issue because there's really not much in the Quran that talks about what is, if there is a guarantee. The Quran itself talks about the martyr and the blessings that are given. Again, I'll cover that tomorrow, but this is the, really the key verse. The martyr, Shahid, actually has seven blessings from Allah. Huh, let's read them. He is forgiven from the moment his blood is shed. One, he will be shown his place in paradise. Two, he'll be spared the trial of the grave. Three, he'll be secure on the day of the greatest terror, the day of judgment. Four, there will be placed on his head a crown of dignity, one ruby of which is better than this world and all that is in it. Five, okay? Here's number six. He will be married to 72 of Al-Hur Alin. That word translates black beauties. The 72 virgins that we hear all the time, right? Okay? Uh, nothing against blonde people, but uh, <laughs> that's just what it says. Now, we miss, we focus on this, and we miss this at the bottom here. And he'll be permitted to intercede for 70 of his relatives. Collective salvation within Islam. That's the real motivation of the martyr. Because you are a rock star in your family. Remember, within Islam, there is no other guarantee of salvation but shaheed. Everything else is a maybe. You hope. Which is why I would ask my parents when I was a kid, if I die, how do I know go to heaven? They didn't want to tell me about this option, so they said, well, it's up to Allah. Allah is fair. Allah is just. I'm like, that's not a good enough answer. How can I know that I know? Which led me to a, a, a tremendous fear of dying and death when I was a Muslim. Can I tell you, in 19 years of a Christian, I've never had that fear? <laughs> Amen? Because I know where I'm going? So when you see suicide bombers, you see martyrs, you see this in Gaza all the time, when Hamas has their funerals for their suicide bombers, they throw a party. You go, why on earth are they throwing a party and celebrating? It's because they believe, why are there uh, families in Gaza raising their kids to be suicide bombers? Because it is the path of salvation. It's not about the 72 virgins. Don't get caught up with that. That's a selling point for the men. That's a recruiting tool that they use. The real recruiting tool is you are a rock star with your family. 
because now your relatives, your immediate family at least, are going to heaven. Now, again, people ask me, well, where do they determine the 70? Don't ask me. And they ask me, what happens to female suicide martyrs? Don't ask me. And don't ask Islamic scholars. They don't have a good answer for you. There is no consensus because there is no verse to deal with female suicide bombers, female martyrs. I wouldn't want to be them. So this is why Islam is a culture of death, not a culture of life. This is why we need to reach out to Muslims because they are victims of this culture of death. I have two of my cousins in Iran. After Iran was taken over by Khomeini, they went to war with Iraq. Iran was losing the battle to Iraq because of the minefield. So they come up with a brilliant idea. I'm being facetious. Khomeini decides, look, we need to recruit young boys so they can become martyrs, the mujahideen. So we're going to give them a promise. We'll give them a, a, a chain with a key around their neck, and this will be the key to paradise. And they will usher in salvation for their families if they're willing to go become martyrs. So they give them a little headband, green headband. You may have seen it where Hamas and Hezbollah wear them, that there is no God but Allah and his, mes and his pro uh, messenger, uh, meaning, meaning Muhammad. And they march these young kids into the minefields. When they blew up, the military that was behind them figured out where not to go. I lost two of my distant cousins to this mentality in Iran because their families at 16, 15, 17 years old sacrificed them so they can have that little keychain and have entrance to heaven. You see some similarities between Catholicism here and Islam. Buying your way into heaven because it's work-based. This is the real motivation. Jihad is the struggle for warfare, yes, to establish a religion. But the ultimate goal of jihad, if you can, if you're able to, again, you'll see this tomorrow, is to lay your life down. Now, what does Christ call us to do? Here's a part of my testimony that I always share. As a Muslim, I'm later when I found out about what the actual, real, only way of salvation was, here I'm as a Muslim thinking, the God of Islam says the best you can do for me is to die for me as a martyr. Now, when the gospel was preached to me, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what proves he is God? I've come to learn that the God of the Bible says, I have died for you so you can live for me and have eternal life with me. And I'm sitting here in 2018 listening to so-called Christians tell me, Sharam, look how much we have in common. No, we don't, church. One is the true God and one is Satan who has a lust for, for blood and for death. How can we be sitting here saying this is common when it is the exact opposite of one another? This is the good news we should be giving to these Muslims, not telling them that they're Abrahamic and worship the same God and look how much we have in common. As I said at Andy's church yesterday, we are actually holding their hands to hell. We don't love them. It's not love to not tell them the truth. It's not love. It just makes us feel good because God forbid we offend the Muslim. So, let me address one final issue of this peace argument, that is the whole argument of ISIS, right? You've heard this. ISIS is not Islamic. Of course, Obama said ISIL. Remember, that was intentional. The Islamic State of Iraq and Levant. L stands for Levant. That's a geographic region from Egypt up to Lebanon, actually up to Turkey, and everything in between, saying that land belongs to Islam. There's a little tiny country that happens to be in the middle of that. Did you figure it out? Israel. So when Obama is saying ISIL, ISIL, ISIL every single time, he knows exactly what he was saying. That's why he was the most anti-Israel president we've had maybe ever. So here's the question. Is ISIS Islamic? Right? We hear that all the time. After every attack, ISIS takes claims responsibility, or whether it's Al-Qaeda, or, or, or uh, it's Hamas, or Hezbollah, or Al-Nusra, or Al-Shabaab. Every time we hear the same thing. This is not Islamic. Right? You heard that? 
This had nothing. The guy is shouting, Allah Akbar, he's killing people like the guy that ran over people in New York with the uh, Home Depot truck. Because, you know, uh, by the way, when, when, when are we ready to ban Home Depot trucks? I, I'm, I'm waiting for that, right? Because we're banning guns. Uh, in, in England, they're banning knives now. They've already taken the guns away. They're banning knives. I want to uh, lead a movement to ban Home Depot trucks. Are you with me? That darn Home Depot truck. It's the evil. It's the root problem. Here's the question we should be asking to answer the question, is, is, is ISIS Islamic? There's actually two questions. The first question is to answer the question, is ISIS Islamic, is, is Muhammad Islamic? The answer is, of course, yes. Right? No Muhammad, no Islam, remember? So here's the second question. Is Muhammad to be imitated by every Muslim? Yes. Remember the Sunnah, the practice, 86%. Remember I showed you? 86% of Islamic texts is about Muhammad. He's the guy. So... Did Muhammad do some of these things in his time? Did he deceive and break treaties with his enemies? Yes. That's what he did. That's what he did to Mecca. He went to Medina, made a 10-year treaty with them called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. After two and a half years, he broke it, came and routed them and killed them. That's what ISIS is doing today. Did he order the killing of apostates? Yes. Directly from his word. And I'll show you that tomorrow night when I cover Sharia law and how it's antithetical to our constitution, I will quote from you the words of the prophet of Islam himself. Did his successors kill apostates? Yes. Abu Bakr, in fact, the, the battle that Abu Bakr fought, who was the first caliph after Muhammad, was called the Ridda Wars, R-I-D-D-A. Ridda is a term in Islam for apostasy. So the main reason that he fought the Ritter Wars because all these people that have been subjugated to Islam by force, Muhammad dies and they're like, yay, we're out of here. You get it, right? Muhammad's dead, we're out of here. So Abu Bakr leads an army to hunt them down and kill them. Did Muhammad order the subjugation of Christians and Jews? You just read Surah 9.5. And 929, did Muhammad order homosexuals to be killed? If I have time, I'll show you that tomorrow. We have this presentation, Islam's Assault on the Constitution. I go through the verses there about how Islam teaches that homosexuality is absolutely a death sentence. Not just a sin, but it's a death sentence. Did Muhammad order sex slaves and child brides? Yes. Did Muhammad order and participate beheadings? Yes. So let me give you an example of that, the last one. Does the Quran, for example, condone beheadings for unbelievers? Watch this. So when you meet those who disbelieve, again, unbelievers in battle, strike their necks. Now, how else can you interpret strike their necks? It's a karate chop. No, with an implement, right? With an object. Until when you have inflicted slaughter. Because you see, if you strike their neck, you do it until you inflict slaughter. What does that mean? Until they're dead. A very plain reading of the Quran. Uh inflict slaughter upon them, then secure their bonds, meaning their hands and their, and their feet, and either confer favor afterwards or ransom until the war lays down its burden. Now you go, well, how can you confer favor to the person you killed? You don't. It's talking about those who are left alive. Because if you kill some and the rest repent, you confer favor upon them. But if they don't, you fight until the war lays down its burden. What does that mean? You fight until the war is over. Until either they win or Islam wins. Do we understand that the ideology of Islam is the one who has declared war on every freedom-loving person in human history and specifically has declared war on Judaism and Christianity? Not the individual Muslim who may or may not know what they believe until you ask them questions, like I did with that doctor in Sioux Falls. But we're talking here about ideology, the verses, the teaching, the prophets. Here is another story out of Sarah Rasul. I'm going to go through this pretty quick here. Again, I cover it more in our Unveiled DVD. Sarah Rasul, page 64. Remember, Sarah is the biography of Muhammad. This is about that. Remember I told you about that one Jewish tribe, what happened to them? That Jewish tribe in Yathrib who wouldn't leave and wouldn't convert, uh, convert to Islam. Let's see what happened to them. When the Banu Karaisa Jewish tribe was surrendered, so in 627, five years after the Hijra happens, they surrender to Muhammad. We're not going to convert, but we're not going to leave our community. So we're going to be at your mercy, Muhammad. By this time, Muhammad is not a prophet, is he? He's a military figure. He's leading a military. Unconditionally, they surrender unconditionally. The apostle confined them, meaning that he jailed them in, the, in Medina, in the quarter of Al-Harith. Now it goes on to say, the apostle went out to the market of Medina and ordered the digging of trenches in it. Some have referred this to as the battle of trenches. 
Then he sent for them, the Jews, and struck off their heads in those trenches. Do you need an interpretation there? Are we okay? <laughs> As they were brought out to him in batches, tying both their hands with their necks. What does Surah 47 just say? To bound them, to tie them. That picture that I just showed you, let me go back here real quick. This picture that I just showed you, this is the ISIS killing the Coptic Christians on the shores in Libya. Their hands and their necks are bound together as instructed specifically by the Quran. But they're radicals. No, they're simply following the letter of the Quran. Okay? Now, it goes on to say, in case you were wondering if they were actually beheaded, this beheading went on until the apostle made an end of them. What does that mean? According to its own numbers, there were six or 700 in all, though some put the figure as high as eight or 900. Okay, let's take the lower number. Let's be really generous. The prophet, the peaceful, so-called peaceful prophet of Islam that you see on billboards saying that he liberates women and he's peaceful and tolerant, took prisoners who had surrendered themselves to him peacefully, ordered them to be brought. They done, had done nothing to Islam. Remember, Islam came into their community. The Muslims who claim, well, this is defensive jihad. This is not defensive jihad. This was offensive jihad. And he ties them, brings them, beheads all of them, according to the Sirah, at least 600. Let's take the lower number, 600. Isn't that genocide? Isn't that a genocide? And this is supposed to be the revered final prophet of humanity? That churches open their doors and allow teaching on Sunday schools about the life of the Prophet Muhammad. I doubt that they're teaching this when they're teaching the life of the Prophet Muhammad. I doubt that our schools, when they teach Muhammad in the textbooks, are teaching this. When they claim Jesus is claimed to be the Son of God by Christians, but Muhammad is the final messenger of God when they talk about him. By the way, Muhammad didn't order it. He participated in it. We've got to move on. So here's the conclusion of this part. Can there be peaceful Muslims? The answer is yes. My dad, to some extent, was one of those. He was a, secular, a lukewarm Muslim. He was a military guy. He grew up most of his life as a military guy. I never saw my dad pray. Well, actually, I'll take that back. I saw my dad pray twice. I saw my dad go to the mosque once or twice in his whole life. He drank alcohol, he ate pork, he smoked. He was a good sinner, you know what I'm saying? You know, like we are, like we all are. And I never heard him talk about Jews and Christians. I never heard him talk about these things. So should I observe Islam from his behavior or should I observe Islam from the text? Today, Christians say to us, well, you know, the God, God's okay with X, Y, Z. You hear that, right? God's okay with X, Y, Z. God's okay with homosexuality. I prayed about it, and I have peace. God's okay with it. Should we evaluate whether that's true from what they say, or should we go to the text of the Bible and find out what God says? So why do we not apply the same principle to Islam? Because we're, we're, we're ruled by emotionalism in the church and not the seeking of truth. So there can be peaceful Muslims. There can never be a peaceful Islam unless your definition is surrendering to Islam. To Islam. What do they call our house? Dar el Harb. What does that mean? House of war. They have declared war on unbelievers, not us. And we don't understand that. Can there be moderate Muslims? Well, technically, yes, but really that term does not exist because within the Quran, if you are a quote-unquote moderate, meaning you, you follow some, you don't follow some, the Quran calls that person a hypocrite. If you persist as a hypocrite, you can then be deemed as an unbeliever and be treated as an apostate. But can there be a moderate Islam? Never. It's impossible. Because what's their goal? Go from lower house to upper house. What's their goal? Become the final religion. Sub Every other religion must be subservient until you'll see tomorrow Jesus comes back that no other religion will be accepted. There's only one Islam, the Islam of Muhammad and Allah. And 93 times in the Quran, Muslims are commanded to imitate Muhammad. In fact, the Quran gives this term to him. Al-Insan al-Kamil. In Arabic, that means the perfect man. The perfect human. 
So Allah, the God of Islam, according to Muhammad, who was the only one who got revelation, I'm going to say that about 1,800 times this conference. So we leave here and you understand, he's the only one who got revelation. They call him the perfect human, the perfect humanity. They're to follow him. That's what he claims. So it's set up in a way that they can't question, right? Because if he's the perfect human, they have to emulate him. So here's the question that I want to ask you again. Is ISIS Islamic? If ISIS is doing everything that Muhammad did, then ISIS is the truest form of Islam if you take it to its full extension. Those Muslims that are choosing not to take it to its full extension are not true, devoted Muslims. And we'll talk about reform it just here in a couple of minutes. We're almost d done here. Sahih Muslim 133, the messenger of Allah said, what? I've been commanded to fight against people till they testify there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Sahih Muslim, remember the second most quoted hadith. So what, what is Allah saying? Look, I've been commanded to fight until people testify that only Allah is God and I'm the messenger. That's what I've been commanded to do. So if they're supposed to emulate him, what should good Muslims do? Also fight until non-Muslims confess and pray the shahada if you and i choose because i will never i will never ever 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 confess the shahada if you choose to do that then what we're doing is subjugating ourselves we're literally teaching our children in public schools to be subjugated because they're already learning the shahada so um, well, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this video. I'll, I'll try to show it tomorrow. This is a video out of Norway, very powerful video. I'll show it tomorrow when we talk about the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamic movement of how the so-called moderate Muslims is, is a fallacy even among Muslims. You'll see that. So in wrapping up, I wanna address two, uh, mo two movements within Islam that will claim everything I just said is wrong. Because they'll say, look, there is a way we can get around this Sharam Here's the first way. Let's reform Islam. We can reform Islam. You've heard of Ayan Hursan Ali. She wrote a book by Why Islam Needs a Reformer. Zudi Jasser, who I'll talk about. These are reformers. We, just like Christi the claim is, just like Christianity went through a reform, Islam can go through a reform. Bingo, we're done. We can bring Islam into the 21st century. Well, there's two things. One, Islam already went through a reform. After the fall of the Ottoman Empire in, in, in 1918, the full fall, the launch of the Muslim Brotherhood was a reforming movement. It was a reformation movement. It was a revivalist movement. I'll talk about that tomorrow. To do what? Revive the caliphate, the Islamic world global order. But they realized that we've done it through empires and it's too easy to defeat us. We need a global Islamic movement where the ummah, that's the name for the Islamic community, can all work together. We can't be single, an empire or a nation. We're too easy to defeat. And those nations or empires typically end up, not, end up more in a, in a secular. Because remember, what happened to Turkey after the fall of the Ottoman Empire? It went secular for many, many years until the last 10, 15 years. It is now going back towards an Islamic country. And as we know prophetically in Ezekiel 38, Turkey is mentioned four times in the Gog-Magog description. Four times. So it's a key player in coming against Israel in that battle. And we see with Erdogan, right? With Erdogan is the, 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 uh, Congress or the parliament in Turkey, more Sharia is being applied, persecution is increasing. Now, why can reformation not happen in Islam? Well, remember, what, what, is, what did Muhammad claim happened to the early verses? They were abrogated. He then says, I received the latter verses, which authorizes him to wage war upon unbelievers. Remember, that's the definition of jihad. So here's my question to you. If that is wrong... And that, and that abrogation shouldn't have happened and Islam needs to remain a quote-unquote peaceful religion that has no compulsion, then wouldn't you say Muhammad is wrong? Right? Muhammad claimed this is from God. He was wrong. Therefore, he's a false prophet. And he's still a homicidal, genocidal maniac. That hasn't changed. In fact, you could argue he's one of the worst war criminals in human history, if not the worst. But if you say Muhammad is wrong... What happens to the revelation? It has to go away. Why? Because he's the only witness. Remember, I'm going to say it 1,805 times. 
He's the only one who got revelation. If you destroy the source of the revelation, you must destroy the revelation. So no revelation, no Quran. No Quran, no Islam. Now listen, I'd be okay with that. I've told some of these reformers, I've met with some, I said, listen, let's have a press conference. We'll go before the media and we'll say, we found the way to reform Islam. They go, great, what's your idea? Well, we're going to stand up, we're going to say, today we denounce Muhammad as the prophet of Islam. He was a false prophet, Islam is a false religion. They go, uh, what? I go, simple solution. They go, we can't do that. We can't denounce Muhammad. I go, then you can't reform Islam. Because he did it. Everything you're talking about that is the violent Islam, he did so when you, and you, you get into a discussion with someone that wants to say, this, isn't, this is not Islamic, next time you say, what did Muhammad do? Take them back to the source. And that's how you're going to refute their argument, just like that with that doctor. Will you denounce what Muhammad taught about killing apostates? And that Muslim said, no. Here's the other aspect, Sufism or Ahmadiyyaism. These are two cults within Islam. Each of those carry less than 1% of the Muslim population. Sufism is mysticism. The Ahmadiyya uh, is a population, there's a lot of them in, in Western society, North America. They claim to be the peaceful Muslims, and they claim, look, the abrogation didn't happen. But again, they don't understand if the abrogation never happened, then Muhammad has to be wrong. You would have no Islam. So that they're choosing to basically try to live by the early verses and reject all the latter verses. Well, good luck. But when Muslims come in power, guess who the first ones are killed? Just recently, I was telling someone during the break, you remember about two or three months ago, there was a bombing of a mosque in Egypt. Well, guess what? It was the Sunnis bo bombing a Sufi mosque. Because Sufis are a cult in Islam. Ahmadiyya are a cult within Islam. They are less than 1% of the total Islamic population. Who is the biggest? Sunnism. So the final point for tonight is this. The best reform for Muslims, this is my advice to Muslims and those of you who want to talk to Muslims, here's the best reform, become a Christian. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So the final goal, Islam must claim their superiority over humanity. They want to establish, Ikhmatu Deen means a commandment of Allah to establish Sharia upon the world. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night. Islam is not a religion, folks. We'll talk about that more because the biggest misnomer that we have right now in protecting Islam in the West is it's a religion. If we can change that argument, we have a chance to be able to shine light onto what Islam really is. Islam's ultimate goal remains a global Islamic caliphate under Sharia, they believe, as I'll show you tomorrow, that, or uh, on Wednesday, that Jesus is, or tomorrow, Jesus is going to come back and ultimately help the Mahdi to do that. Of course, it won't happen. You know that, right? It won't happen. And finally, they have a constitution. I use that term very specifically. Sharia is their constitution. It's not just religious. It's governmental, military, financial, civil, criminal. It's a constitution. And here's the big question for Western society. We're going to have to choose their way or our way. The way of freedom, the way of Judeo-Christian principles, or the way of Islam. It, it is a clash of civilizations. We are at war with an ideology. We just don't want to admit it because the notion of that seems harsh. I would argue that the behavior of Islam has been harsh for 1,400 years. The good news is the Lord will deal with Islam. He will. I don't doubt that. The sad thing is we're seeing Christians deceived by it and we're seeing Muslims deceived by not hearing the gospel. Let us commit. Let us commit to fulfilling the Great Commission. And I hope this ideology helps you to understand when you see the real Islam, as I saw in my birth country, I saw this real Islam manifest in my birth country when it took over in 1979. When you see that, I pray the Lord will give you a greater burden for the lost who are victims of this demonic ideology. God bless you, and I'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. I got two that came in earlier, but we're short of time. We really need to be out of here by 9.15. So, two quick questions that came in. Okay, finally, somebody turned my mic on. Okay.
Here we go. Uh, this is from Clifton Dolly in Rochester Hills, Michigan. I've recently been told by a Shia Muslim that they are peaceful, not violent, like Sunnis, and especially Wahhabi Muslims. The statement is also emphatically made that Iran is a free country for all religious persuasions. <laughs> And it's not a sponsor of terror. Please lend some insights. I think you gave a lot tonight. Yeah, I mean, where do we begin with that question? I know Clifton, by the way. He's a brother of the Lord. But where do we begin with that? Well, first of all, the Iran issue. I mean, come on. That's just nonsense, right? That's propaganda. Talk to someone who's lived in Iran, come out of Iran. Talk to the 100 Christians who are in prison right now in Iran. Talk to the journalists who were jailed by the Iranian government for criticizing Islam. Iran lost its freedoms in 1979. Talk to the protesters that just went through. Right now, as we speak, over 4,000 protesters remain missing after the recent protests. Over 4,000. And what is that, Amnesty International, whatever they're trying to figure out. So in that sense, I think that's pretty clear. That's propaganda. Um, Shia Islam, look, one of the things that the Sharia law book does, even though this is a Sunni source, in the back is a section on Shiism. And it says about the Shias, look, on the majors of Islam, we agree. Everything I share with you tonight are the majors. They're not the minors. Yes, they have differences over, they have 14 verses that they differ over. They differ, to, they differ over the caliph's successors. But they accept the hadiths that are traced back to Muhammad. They accept the Quran in its majors. And everything that I said about Islam, Shias believe. And so my example to you is, do we see in Lebanon that is Shia? Do we see in Syria that is Shia? Do we see in Iran that is Shia a free people? when Islam took over. No, the proof is in the pudding. Islam, whether Shiism or Sunniism, is not um, peaceful. The Sufism, what claims peaceful, and the Ahmadiyya, as I said, they do claim, because they're, they're rejecting the majority of, that, of, the, of the abrogated verses. So, you know, there, there are those kind of Christians too, right? Christians who claim Christianity but reject uh, huge parts of the Bible. But you and I wouldn't call them true Christians, right? So these are not true Muslims. Okay. All right. Thank you tonight. Oh, that that was okay, fabulous. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. One question. Yeah, because actually it came in twice, so I thought it was oh, two different questions. Oh, it came in twice, so it was really important. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Just a reminder, tomorrow morning we start at 8.30. Be here a little bit before. Uh, so you make sure you get your seat and some coffee and all of those things. We'll be back here again another long day tomorrow. Um, so those of you who are taking a ride back to the hotel, you need to go meet at uh, like front of the back, wherever that was. You all remember. You know where you're supposed to be. But facilitate because we need to get out of here so the people who are here helping and everything, they'll be back earlier in the morning, can do so. Let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for uh, the insights that we get uh, on this uh, wicked, dark, evil, satanic religion. And Father, help us to develop a love for uh, all of the lost, and especially those who are enslaved in the darkness of Islam. Father, we pray that you'd give us insights, that we would pray for these people, because ultimately the war that we are in, whether we wanted it or not, is a war they declared on the West and yet, as Christians, we are to love our enemies, and the way to do that is to give them the truth, to give them the gospel, and to understand how to communicate that, because the only thing that will win is the gospel. It's not a war, ultimately, of bullets and bombs. It is a war that is spiritual and must be won with the spiritual truth of the gospel. So, Father, give us the wisdom to use that wisely. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.